So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Pastor Steve Flombach from our one-on-one -on -one church, Evansville, Indiana. Let's give him a I just wanted to say that uh, any married man knows that uh, if he offends his wife, they can be silent for more than half an hour. <laughs> more than that. <laughs> and the price is high. I that in counseling trouble. Yeah, right. And the price you pay is high. <laughs> Uh, let's pray together. Yeah. Uh, God, lead us in prayer, if you would, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And thank you for those who are here to share with us today the good things of the Lord. Mm -hmm. We look to you today for your help and strength and direction in our lives. And we pray a special anointing mm -hmm. for Pastor Steve today as he shares about grace, how we need it. Mm -hmm. And we ask your blessing upon us all yes. in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah. How many of you ever had a son? Yeah. yeah. How many of you ever had a son who was so much like you that he got in a lot of trouble? <laughs> <laughs> I had one of those, my first, Pete. And uh, in, uh, in one of those troubling times, we had one of our sessions in his room. And um, it was, uh, I did a lot of talking. I did less talking. I did more talking by far than I did spanking. But... There was a time for a spanking, and uh, so I walked into his room. He knew he was guilty. Uh, I knew he was guilty. There was no question. He knew what the penalty was, and I, I think there were three swats coming or something like that with the paddle, and uh, we walked into his room, and I said, son, you know what you've done? He said, yes, and I said, you know what I have to do, and you know I don't want to do this, but you know I've got to do it. He said, yes. I said, now I'm going to teach you something I hope you always remember. I said, uh, it's about grace. Mm. I said, you've got a spanking cup. But you've told me you're sorry. And I said, I know part of the reason you're sorry is because you've got a spanking coming. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, I really see in your eyes... Uh, I believe you really are sorry you did it. And uh, I forgive you. And I'm not going to spank you. And his jaw dropped. Yeah. And he said, why? I said, because that's what Jesus mm -hmm. does for us. Mm -hmm. Good restriction. I said, uh, I've got punishment coming I've never received. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because of God's grace. And most of all, I've got hell that I deserve. Richly, thoroughly deserved it. And uh, Jesus died on the cross and took my place, mm -hmm. died in my place, so I don't have to go to hell. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, that's grace. Yes. He said, wow. Mm -hmm. You're not going to spank me? I said, no. Yeah. That's grace. I walked out of that room feeling so good about having communicated that great spiritual truth. And I think it did. I think this it did. Is. But there came a time when we needed to go back into the room. Again. Because <laughs> I had a son like me. And uh, we walked back in there and, and I said, son, same same deal. You know what you did, yeah. You know what the penalty is. And uh, I said, uh, I said, so bend over. And I administered three swats or whatever it was. And then afterwards, he turned around, and as we always did, we hugged, and he was crying. And, and I said, I forgive you, son. He said, Dad. I said, what? He said, I like grace better. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, hey, man. so do I. <laughs> so do I. Amazing grace. <laughs> In John 1, verse 17, we see that Mount Sinai set us up for Mount Calvary. 
The Bible says the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So we had all these rules. And here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to help me teach this today. Because it is, it would be a total waste of your firepower for me to be the only one talking about this. So do a little bit of what you did for Brother Fry. And as you look at these passages, before we go on to the next one, uh, if you see something, just jump in. Raise your hand or speak up and add to it because I believe we'll all learn more because you've all walked you've all walked this walk and you've studied this word and I want to learn as much as I share today. So knowing what the rules are and not being able to keep them set us up this 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 terrible tension, this this sense that I I can't do this and yet I've got to do it. God deserves it. And uh, and so we have this, this terrible tension, and God comes along and He says, I'm going to offer you grace. Never take for granted the impact of God's grace on you. Do I need to say that every time? Are you staying with you? You know what, what's happening? We got it? All right. No, you're you, still with me. Next. All right. You're still, yeah, next slide. <laughs> if, if I get too far ahead, <laughs> we'll I'll catch up somehow. We'll say, next, 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 next slide. Yeah. Never take for granted the impact of God's grace. On you. Isaiah 26.10. Look at this. When grace is shown to the wicked, they don't learn righteousness. Even in a land of uprightness, they go on doing evil and do not regard the majesty of the Lord. Isaiah gave us that before the cross. Yeah. He gave us a lot before the cross, didn't he? Yeah. He told us what Jesus was going to look like mm -hmm. and who he was going to be. But that's... When you and I receive grace, it changes us. Yes, sir. But those who are wicked, those who do not choose the Lord, they see grace and they just think, you're easy, you're, you're a pushover. And they take advantage of the very thing that melts our hearts. And so that's the difference in you and me. If you've responded to grace, you know, the Bible says nobody can come to the Father unless He enables us. Mm -hmm. Are you... You can preach all you want to somebody that God's not drawn, and guess what? It's not going to happen. And you know that's true. And we've seen it time and time and time again. Um, so what is grace? G-R-A-C-E. You know this acrostic. Yeah. God's riches at Christ's expense. Yes, sir. Says it. Says it all. For it is by grace, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. You have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by work so that no one can boast. I know that. I preached it. I believe it. And I keep forgetting it. Anybody else? Sure. We, sure. Some of the stuff we do to try to earn a little more yeah. of God's grace, which of course is an oxymoron. Right. Uh, we... We do that, and sometimes we even use that as leverage in our churches when we preach and teach and all the rest. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I uh, when I was uh, an associate pastor and teaching my my uh, Bible class at the time of, of single adults, uh, they, they uh, made fun of me because I pushed on some things so often. They said, "Well, I I I know how to get to heaven." And they said, you're supposed to tithe. And, you're and they, they listed the things that I was teaching on a lot. And uh, they said that it, they felt me putting that kind of leverage on it. And certainly truth is truth. But again and again, we have to come back to our obedience is in gratitude for what God alone has done. It's not our works. Uh, Paul said in, and to the church of Galatia, he said, so help me, guys, if you think you have to be circumcised, Christ, Christ is no use to you. What's what? And we forget that. We, we, we preach grace and then we take it away from people if we're not careful. Because we want so badly for them to do the right thing. And, and, and frankly, it is outrageous that God would let us get away with the stuff He does and forgive us like He does. I, we've got to repent. We are not supposed to sin. But, at, but it's outrageous of what he's forgiven. If, if we just lined up the sins that are represented in this room. Oh, no, no. Don't do not that. the ones anybody knows about. I'm talking about the ones nobody knows about. If we just line those up. 
And if we displayed them, and we had people vote on whether or not you and I ought to be forgiven for those things? Yep. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it is. It is outrageous. It's an affront to, to justice that God does what He does for us. And yet He does it because He loves us. Amen. You experience that, I think, when you do have a child who, who blows it, and you get so mad at him, and you want to kill him. You know it? You shouldn't. <laughs> and you don't. Yeah. You but then you forgive them from your heart. And, and it's, it's, it's an amazing thing that happens in the heart of a parent. And yet God is far more loving than we are. And he also knows far more than a parent ever does. Amen. About what you and I have done. It's not by works so that no one can boast. John Newton, in 1779, wrote the lyrics to Amazing Grace. I just thought it might be helpful if uh, over these next passages where the Bible talks about grace, we tie the verse that expresses what we've just looked at in Scripture and sing it together. Mm -hmm. And also, I thought at 10 o'clock, you'd probably be tipping forward and falling asleep if we didn't have some help. So uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll, we'll keep ourselves going with this. Let's sing it together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved. say that, he said, it's a, it's a good saying. Everybody else say it. Yeah, that's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when Jesus didn't give himself to, to the people who were carrying on and on about him? Why? Because the Bible says he knew what was in a man. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. We're every one of us wretches. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the worst of <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, even, and it's hard to say, it's easy to say about yourself, because you know yourself. But uh, it's hard to say about your sainted grandmother or somebody else. That's just because you're not in there. You don't know the things she battles. And you don't know how many times she wanted to kill you. <laughs> His amazing grace means you don't have to be afraid to confess your weakness to Jesus. It's hard to say everything that you've done to somebody. Um, or that you've, you've uh, done to hurt others. It's hard to admit that. And especially to the judge. I mean, if you, if, can you imagine? I've said, how many of you sat in court and watched the proceedings yeah, a little bit? Sure. Usually with somebody that was wanting you there with them. And, uh, and you see all that. What if a person standing before the judge and he's about to pronounce? What if a person standing before the judge and he's about to pronounce? judgment and sentence and you say, uh, Your Honor, uh, there are a couple other things you don't know about that I thought you would. <laughs> what do you typically do? You keep your mouth shut and hope he doesn't know everything that you did. If you're, you know, a person who, you know, there was that other drug deal and then that person that I, you know, and, and so, and then there was that time I stole that and we don't want to do that. We have a huge reluctance to it. But when we come to that time with Jesus, because of grace, we can empty it all out and know that He's not going to reject us. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to, to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way. Does that blow your mind? It does mind. Because it gets in the way of what I want to think about with Jesus. Now, He didn't give in to any of it, the Scripture says. 
But he knows every single temptation you face. You say, well, he didn't know, yeah, I mean, the internet and that. Oh, listen, it's old. The, those temptations are old. The, yep. the method by yeah. which they come to you may be new. Yeah. But it's the same old stuff. Yeah. Satan's not too original. He keeps coming at you with the same mm -hmm. junk. We have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with what? With confidence. Confidence. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's a, it's a compliment to him. When I tell him everything, because he already knows it, and when I tell him everything, and I know he's my judge, and yet I tell it to him. What I'm saying to him is, you are that loving. You are that amazing. <laughs> you know, and you feel, as you do that, you begin to feel like you're a trophy of God's grace. Mm -hmm. You think, just exactly what Paul did. There is no one who's a worse sinner. There's no one who is more terrible than I am. And for you to forgive me, oh God, oh God, oh God. That's, I believe that's where the heart of worship comes from. Mm -hmm. It's not just God's grace and goodness. In a general way, it's that he is so good to cotton picking, rotten, wretched me. Uh -huh. It's just, it's, it just blows your mind. That one uh, chorus we sang last night, uh, when, when temptation comes my way, uh, you know, t teach me to call. And when I can't, you know, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That you. breaks me every single time. Mm -hmm. Because when temptation comes our way, how many times have we given in? Mm -hmm. And all we had to do was call on Him. Yeah. I have never called on the Lord to help me overcome temptation, but what He has come through. Every single time, yeah. He has come through. There's not one time He's failed me. My problem is wanting to call on Him when I'm being yeah. tempted. Yeah, that's, it. that's a hard thing to confess. Easier to ask forgiveness. But that's it. You know, it's just, it's, here's the temptation, and boy, it looks good, and I know if I ask Him, He'll protect me from that temptation, give me strength to stand. So I don't want to ask. <laughs> That's the rottenness that we're fed, that he's facing. That's what he deals with with you and me. That's it. Oh boy. So when I cannot stand, I just fall on you. You know, God, you know, you know how rotten I am to the core. Please, Jesus, please take this poor wretch and turn me around. Let's sing this next verse. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first. So the grace of God was precious to you when you first believed. It was to me. I was seven. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. I was seven years old. Thought I was going to heaven on my parents' yeah. coat strings. I was in church every time they were. We were the first ones to get there. We were the last ones to leave. We had to dust the seats every Sunday for people. We had to turn out the lights. You know, I mean, I was in. I mean, I was part. Yeah, I was. I was a swan buck, you know. I mean, that, that, that swan buck that just talking about this. My dad, my mom, all that kind of stuff. I, I knew the stuff. I sometimes I, you know, uh, I, I knew what the teacher was going to say before I said it. You know how it is with preachers kids. And we had an evangelist who stood up. His name's Wendell Nance. Remember that guy? Oh my! He threw songbooks and things like that, which you know it was. He, he, he had his own set of flaws like we all do. And, uh, but I'll tell you one thing. I will always be grateful to the way God used him. Yeah. Because he stood up and he said, I'm going to say to every single one of you, you cannot get to heaven on your parents' coattails. Mm -hmm. And I sat there at seven years old and said, say what? <laughs> it's what? You mean I'm on my own here? I'm stripped of schwambachness? <laughs> <laughs> What? 
I, I mean, it rocked me to my core. Oh, yeah. I sat there. I just felt naked. I thought, we got to do something about this because I knew what it was. <laughs> and, man, I couldn't wait. And so I still remember, I mean, you know, if the, if the pulpit was here, this is where I came and I knelt right here, boy, and I knelt there at the altar. And, uh, and somebody came and prayed with me, and I said, I've got to get right. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I still remember that emotion. Sure. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. But you know what? I've sinned worse sins than a seven-year-old since then. Now maybe you have it since you've been saved. Mm -hmm. His grace is more precious to me today. Yes. Amen. Even than when I first believed. Yeah. Yes, sir. I love this grace that taught my heart to fear, so it scares you to death when you realize sinner in the hands of an angry God. <laughs> and then you realize but he's the God who offers grace. Amen. And grace, my fears, relieved. Next slide. There you go. <laughs> I remember that. God's amazing grace doesn't spare, spare from the trouble you need, but empowers you to triumph through it. We need trouble. I'm pretty sure of that. Because I've had my share and some of your shares. It seems like some days. But as I look back and see what God did through the trouble, mm -hmm. I realize that some of the things that I have grown in could only have come through the trouble. Yeah. Without trouble, I never would have gone deep enough. And, uh, of course, it kind of scares me knowing that that's true about the future. <laughs> Except grace, my fears relieved. <laughs> I know that he's going to come through me. Join with me, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 1, join with me in suffering for the gospel. Well, isn't that an exciting, let's all get on this trip. Join with me in suffering for the gospel. So this guy who's preaching to me is suffering and he wants me to suffer too. Sign me up. Because I need it. I need it. It is, when we try to get people saved, it is so tempting to tell them how great it is to know Jesus. Which is true. Sure. But then to leave out the part that will cause some of them to stumble. That's true. When they discover that it is not all peaches and cream afterwards. Because what you have done, the moment you cross that line, is to make a permanent enemy out of Satan, who has come, as we've already been reminded this morning, to kill, steal, and destroy. And he's now going to target you. You've just drawn a target on your front, your back, your head, your feet, and all of the people you love. If he can't get to you directly, then he'll get to you through the ones that you love and that you care about. Wow. And he'll take your time and cripple you and, and uh, embarrass you and hurt you through them if he can. Paul invites us into this battle. Join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. Purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Before the beginning of time. I believe that, first of all, he's saying this in a sense for the whole plan of God for the church. But I believe that his grace is so great and his knowledge of power is so great that before the beginning of time he knew about me personally. He knew about you. He knew us. He planned for us. And he knew how much trouble we were going to have to have to get our little old head straight. Come on. That's right. And our hearts right. And uh, it's His grace given us in Christ Jesus that takes us through that, which is why you've got to sing this next verse. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have It was his 
grace. Amen. It wasn't, man, that was that. I preached a, I preached a sermon like nobody would have met. You know, oh, whoa, you know. I think that one of my, one of my come up and says early in my ministry was I, I prepared a message. I, I was on my way to a work day at youth camp. We had a bunch of teenagers in the car. And uh, I had a car that was new to me. And uh, the car in front of me was going slow. And so I uh, went to pass. And the car decided he didn't want to be passed. No. And he speeded up. Oh. And the car behind me closed in the gap. <laughs> and about that time, we were coming up on a cross street. And uh, that person looked to the left because they were going to turn right and saw that it was open on the left. Did not check to make sure that there was nobody coming in their lane. And they turned right into me. Mm. And I totaled my car. Oh. But none of us was injured. I lost the car, but all of us were, were fine. We were safe. So that Sunday night, I used that story in a masterful way. <laughs> <laughs> and I set an alarm clock for my final point at three minutes to midnight. And that thing went off at the climax of my message. And I said, I'm telling you, it's midnight for your soul. And I told that story earlier. And I said, those kids could have been dead today. We could be having their funeral tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. <laughs> and, it's, and, it, and they didn't know it. And they were young. And how many? And so five people got saved. God. That night. And I thought, obviously I'm called to preach. You preach like that. I mean, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> we had Wednesday night service after that, and one of those who got saved stood up and gave a testimony. And I, I'll tell you what I expected. In, in my humility, <laughs> I thought he would say, I have never heard a sermon as powerful as that, and God just used it to bring me to the throne of <laughs> He stood up and he said, You know, I trusted Christ uh, Sunday. Everybody said, hey, Amen. Yes, he said. He said, the Lord was just dealing so hard with me. Yes, amen. He said, I didn't hear a word that the preacher said. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, oh, I shrank about two feet right there. And it was just a reminder. God will right. even use a piece of baloney like I am to bring it up on you. You know, just if the guy will oh, shut up long enough to give an invitation, they'll come. <laughs> so, you stand only because His amazing grace enables you to stand. Do you believe that? Amen. Not because you're tough. Not because you've learned some things. <laughs> we have gained, Romans 5, 2, we have gained access by faith into this grace mm -hmm. in which we now stand. Mm -hmm. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Oh. It's what I if I stand at all, I'm standing by grace. God's propping me up. Mm -hmm. You know, if 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 uh, you talk about those Jezebels mm -hmm. in your church, mm -hmm. I've seen a few. Mm -hmm. sure. Uh, some of them, I'm pretty sure, had just a little some jewelry that said Jezebel. I'm not sure, but it was really clear. I had uh, Jez. <laughs> I, one, one Sunday morning, I was preaching, and there was a woman sitting on about row three, staring at me the whole time. And it wasn't a, like a holy stare. It was just one of the, you know. Every once in a while, while you're preaching, one face sticks mm -hmm. out to you, and she was looking at me in a way that I was a bit disconcerting. And uh, so. I shouldn't have been surprised when, on Monday, my secretary said, uh, you've got an appointment during the counseling hours I had uh, with a, a visitor to a church. And uh, in came this woman. And everything in me went on alert. This, you know how Satan works. Mm -hmm. This was an appointment right for lunch. I'd been home for lunch. And Judy and I had one of those wonderful discussions that make you so happy you're married. <laughs> and I came back feeling like I was the most misunderstood husband on the face of the earth. Here I am, a man of God, serving God, 
and this woman doesn't get it. She just, you know, mm -hmm. and so I was a little ticked at my wife, and then in walks Jezebel. <laughs> she sat, uh, she sat in the chair, and uh, I just thought, instead of taking the chair on the other side, just something said, stay behind the desk, son. Mm -hmm. So I decided, I, you're not supposed to counsel across the desk, because it creates, you know, it's like, yeah, it's embarrassing. I thought I needed one right then. <laughs> you were right. <laughs> Very attractive woman. More dangerous. And, uh, yeah. And she talked for a few minutes, and she said, I just, I just need your help. You're just such a wonderful person. I got so much out of your message in it. You know, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and immediately I could tell this was just not, this was no good. And so I started trying to shut it down quickly. And uh, when she could tell that was happening, she got up from the, her seat and she came around. She said, I just want to hug oh, you. Oh, oh, oh. And she came around this way and I walked around that <laughs> way. And, and right out to my secretary's office and I said, and Kathy will show you where you can leave and we'll continue to pray for you. I learned later that she had attended the church that had just lost their pastor and had had an affair with him and had broken that marriage and ended his pastorate at one of the larger churches in Evansville. That was the woman. She destroyed that one, and she was coming after this one. Yes, sir. You stand only because his amazing grace enables you to stand. Satan will set you up. He will, he will put it all in place. But God will prop you up and give you a strength you did not know. But when you win, don't say, you know what? There's some strong preacher out there. Man, I took it on the chin. And, yeah. No, say, oh Jesus. But for the grace of God. There go I. Like that other pastor. Amen. Let's sing it. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as I endure. Can you look back and see a time when he was Absolutely. And you look back and say, oh my God, I was that close. And you stare at me. The grace of God. You're going to live forever for one reason and one reason only. <laughs> Amazing grace. None of this is new to us, but it's just good to live in it for a little bit, isn't it? <laughs> Ro Romans 5, where sin increased, Grace increased all the more, all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. <laughs> Paul makes it clear, he says, now, we're not supposed to conclude by this, that you know, let's sin, let's sin a whole lot more so that God's grace gets bigger and bigger. He made that clear. But what he's telling us is that there's no sin you and I have committed. There's no wrong you and I have done. And by the way, there's no wrong that's been done to you that God can't forgive. Mm -hmm. right. Amen. Yeah. Now, it's as hard as it is for me to believe that <laughs> the wrongs I've done are totally forgivable by God. It's even harder <laughs> to justify the wrongs done against you and against me, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, we just say, there's no excuse for that. Yeah. But there's no excuse for what you and I did. We, yeah. we, are, we are educated far beyond our yeah. obedience, right? Yeah. We, the problem with knowing what we know and studying the Bible like we get to do and preaching it and teaching it is that we have no excuse. We are excuseless. That's it. We, you and I are in a terrible, terrible uh, place of needing grace. Yeah, yeah. preaching. You know, uh, I was I was watching. You got. I know you're called a preacher. You got a preaching figure. 
I, I, you, you, you got preaching finger. That's one of the first things you know when you're called to preach. You got that preaching finger out, and you're whipping it on, and it was working on us. Uh, uh, but but the reality is, when you and I use that preaching finger, God, you know, God just saying, okay, so you know it. You know it, don't you? You can, t you can catch a sinner a mile away with that preaching finger, and guess what? And when you and I see that, I mean, those of us who preach and teach and are responsible to lead, yeah. whoa, whoa, and yet to think where our sin increased, grace increased all, I've, I've observed something over the years, I don't know, you check me out, see if you, if you found this, the, the sins in others that make us the maddest are the ones that we are either tempted with ourselves, or have given into. Come on. In public or private. Uh, and I mean, well, let's see if I can say it. There, there was a, an evangelist once who was ripping another evangelist for his fall mm -hmm. while he himself mm -hmm. was committing the same sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was furious at it. Why? He was furious at his own sin. Yeah. Yeah. So a clue for me is when I see something that somebody else is doing or has done that just sets me off. I mean, more than most. I mean, I go, whoa, that's, there's no excuse for that. Then I better look inward because that may be something that Satan yes. is either doing or fixing to try to do right. in me. Uh -huh. the, the old Shakespeare company he thinks the man doth protest too much. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, sometimes that's a dead giveaway. Let's sing it. Yea, when this flesh and heart shall fail, and mortal life shall cease, I shall. amazing grace have to do with your calling and mine. Mm. Paul writes in Acts 20, however, I consider my life worth nothing mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. My only aim mm -hmm. is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. I love, Brother Fry, Brother Fry that you, you nailed us on that soul winning business. You can go you can go a, a whole series, you can go a whole year, you can go longer without really having a heart for souls. You can just play church. You can, you can wow them with your sermons and your illustrations and the music and all the rest of it. And, and sometimes even when you give the gospel, it can be perfunctory. Yeah. Uh, you don't realize, you know, you can just say, well, I did it. I offered the gospel and then, you know... But, but it's that desperation to see people saved. That's what makes you that, that life transformation. And that's what we are called to do. To ask God to use us for His purpose. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. Pastor, uh, he said, I, I appreciate that you lead a church and all that kind of thing. He said, but I'm a doctor. I'm, I'm a heart surgeon. And he said, I deal in matters of life and death. <laughs> and the pastor said, yes, you do. And I deal in matters of eternal life. Amen. Yes, sir. That's what's at stake. That's why we've got to be soul winning churches. Yes. If we ever lose sight of that, mm -hmm. if we ever care more about teaching people who haven't yet been saved, if we ever, it, and, and I, why am I so concerned about this? Because that's a 
a temptation every one of us has. We love the Word. We love studying it. Mm -hmm. We like to... I mean, I, when, when I preach, and I'm sure many of you are doing the same, do the same thing, you, you always want to have something on the lower shelf for those that are new. But, you, but every single time you, you go to the Word, you try, you say, God, please give me something for the person who has been in church for 50 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please, don't, don't let me... You know, and, and, and I know that, you know, tell me the same old story, yeah. uh, you know, cause, because it's a wonderful story, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's everything right with that. That's why we're talking on the basics today, huh? And yeah. you've had a whole yeah. conference built on it. So there's nothing wrong with that. But then I always want to say, I always, I'm always looking for a way to make it fresh and new for the person that has heard it and heard sure. it and heard it. And, sure. I, and maybe one of the reasons is I grew up hearing it and hearing it and hearing it. And I always appreciated if somebody would put a new spin on it, not a new meaning, just help me see it through a new window. And so, but sometimes when we're working so hard to do that, then the salvation part just be, oh, and by the way, bow your heads, close your eyes, everybody, you know, you just can't do that. We can't do that. We can't let that happen because the stakes are not life and death. That's right. They're eternal. Yes, that's true. Life and death. Don't imagine that you're earning that heavenly treasure you're laying up. It's all. It's all amazing grace. Yeah. Acts 20, 32, Now I commit you to God and to the word of His grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Listen, I believe in laying up heavenly treasure. I, I mean, it motivates me. Mm -hmm. I want to, you know, everything I do, I want, to, I want to send on ahead. I believe what Jesus said. You know, we, we're not laying up treasure here where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break mm -hmm. in and steal. But... We're laying up treasure in heaven where, where thieves don't break in and steal, where moth and rust don't corrupt. I believe all of that. It's just I need to be reminded by a passage like this that I'm not laying squat. It's grace. I mean, everything I do, He's doing through me. He's using me to do. He's enabling me to do. And none of it works unless He makes it work. I am His instrument. He, he rewards me. We, we've got this little custom in our church. Years ago for a... At, when I was still at Bethel, uh, I preached a sermon and I was making the point the Word of God has to be primary. So I took one of my old Bibles and had a guy cut a big old stump about this big uh, out of his, you know, bring it to the church. And then we put a big old uh, iron stake. Uh, no verses were harmed in this. But we drove <laughs> and I had him take a big old sledgehammer and I said, look guys, this is the way it's going to be at this church. We're going to put God's Word first. We are driving a stake. And it was uh, the word, you know, uh, the flowers fall, but the word of God stands forever. And so I had the Bible open to that, and he drove that stake down in there, and I, you know, it was powerful, and I used it. And then, sort of, after you use the sermon illustration, it's just sort of sitting there afterwards, and and uh, people said, "What are you going to do with that?" And I said, um, "I guess I'm going to take it to my office." And I sat at my office for a long time, and then there was a day when I wasn't at Bethel anymore, and I took that with me. They didn't want it, and. Uh, <laughs> I'm at one-on-one -on -one church, and I thought, you know what? We, that's, that's a declaration we need to start a church with. Yeah. And uh, so every Sunday, I ask for a volunteer from one of our kids. Now, the kids start out with us in for the music, because uh, that's, that's where we are. And uh, so the kids enjoy the music and all that kind of thing. Before we send them to their classes, I say, who wants to help me move the one-on-one -on -one Bible front and center where it belongs? And so it's over here, and, you know, the kids just love they. They almost fight for the opportunity. They come up after, to me a week in advance and say, can I help you next week? And so it's a big deal for them. And they help me carry the one-on-one -on -one Bible, the whole thing, you know, the, the whole stump. And we put it right front and center in front of where I preach. And uh, then I say, give them a big hand. And then you know, the kid just feels great and everything. And then when it's all over, what do I do? I pick up the stump by myself and go put it back over here. Did I need the little child's help? No, and Jesus doesn't need yours or mine. But, but he lets us help him. I commit, you, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. That is where our inheritance comes from, even from grace. So let's sing it. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the
with every message uh, at our church, I give them a one-on-one -on -one tip. And of course, we named our church after the relationship with Jesus. Uh, that one-on-one -on -one relationship you've got to have. And I say it so frequently to them. Um, if you've got a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus that is deep, daily, moment by moment, and nothing else, you've got it all. But if you have everything else but that, you've got nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Right. True. nothing at all. Yeah. And so I just determined that because it's so easy for me as a pastor, and I think for a lot of pastors and a lot of churches, to let all the other stuff we do in church become so primary that yep. you don't have time for the Lord. I, I have written, I would never use his name. Years ago, I was privileged for a column I was writing uh, to have a half hour with uh, one of the uh, great leaders in our nation, really. Christian leaders. And uh, he's still ministering powerfully today. If I used his name, every one of you here would know it. And uh, I got so much great information. He's just a man that loves the poor, cares about others, and so forth. And uh, toward the end of the interview time, I said, he, he shared with me his schedule. He was in he was leaving me, he's going here, and we're going to do him there, and we're going to fly there, and we're going to do this. I said, man, I said, when do you ever get time to get along with the Lord and just be one-on-one -on -one with Him? And he said, Steve, I struggle with that more than anything else. He said, a lot of days I don't. <coughs> now, he's not telling us anything that we don't know. Well, true. Uh, but that stayed with me. It stuck with me and it scared the fire on me. First of all, I started praying for him. I, and I, I mean, I was careful about how I worded it. I felt like he was certainly way ahead of me. But I said to him, I said, wow. I said, that's scary, isn't it? He said, yes, it is. And I could tell it was really hitting him that I'd asked that question. I wasn't asking him to nail him. I was just probably just going to tell me his secret. <laughs> now, Paul, you know, it's just like, you know, the old, the, the uh, who was the great preacher that said, I'm so busy today, instead of spending an hour, though, I need to spend two. Uh, so, you know, I thought I was going to hear one of those instead of saying, uh, a lot of times I skip it. And I just, I, I said, Lord, help me. Please not do that. And so, every single week, I give our congregation a one on one tip, something that will help them in their one on one relationship with Jesus. So, here's yours. What if Jesus is waiting on you to totally sell out? And I'm not suggesting you have it. But have you ever found that there's more selling out to do than you thought there was last week? So he can make you a trophy of his amazing grace. I was shown mercy. <laughs> this is that passage we referred to a few moments ago. 1 Timothy 1. So that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display His immense patience as an example for those who would believe in Him and receive eternal life. Paul said it. He's the worst of sinners. Mm -hmm. And there have been times in my one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus when I have come to Him broken because I feel like I've won. And... Uh, I only put the word feel like to weaken that a little bit. Actually, I have one. And uh, I find myself, while I'm talking to him about that and confessing my sin, I find myself saying to him, the Lord, I don't know. I don't know what, what you want to do with me, but all I can say is, you give me another chance and I, all of heaven will be flabbergasted <laughs> at your grace. <laughs> what, what if what if he wants you to be a trophy of his grace? What if he was once wants to say, you know, for all of heaven to say about Don. Don out of all people, why would he be so blessed by God? And you'd be the trophy of his grace. Because I know I am not. We'll have to fight for that. <laughs> <laughs> what, if, yeah. what if that's what God's up to? Yeah. Yeah. 
What if that's your hope? When you feel so beaten down and so ashamed and so hurting and so defeated and so uh, ready to give up? Wow. Oh, oh, oh. Hit it, brother. You come to him and say, well, there's one thing left for me. Trophy of your grace. Let's go get him. Let's stand and sing it one more time. That first verse. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Simplistic. Nothing. 